Listen. So previously in our Conjuring timeline, LME, we talked about how the Warrens were practically gearing up to become the paranormal Avengers, and in less than a decade, they've got themselves a whole fleshed out universe. So far, there's been nine movies in the series with extra spin-offs on the horizon. They've been so profitable and scary that the first got an R rating just off of the spooks alone, and this third one even sparked a comic spin-off that's officially kicking off DC Comics horror line. Does it compare to the first two though? Uh, not in my opinion, but it was alright. This time it's the director from La Llorona, which was a movie that was messier than the way the crew says the title. La Llorona. The Curse of La Llorona. La Llorona. But while he doesn't have the master touch that Juan had on the previous ones, he still is able to create some pretty creepy scenes that were well mixed for Dolby, but honestly, I think his Billie Eilish video is scarier. It does cover the first court case in US history where the defense pleaded demonic possession. How do you plead? Your Honor, my client pleads not guilty by reason of demonic possession. And Kevin Bacon had actually starred in a 1983 movie version where the devil had made him do it. But here, they made it into a movie that's part possession horror, part detective procedural, and I'm not even gonna lie, part a superhero movie about faith. You can watch it at home since WB possessed themselves into streaming all their biggest releases this year, but honestly, why the hell would you invite this into your home? Let me explain. Now, the Conjuring series was originally titled The Warren Files, which makes sense since this entire trilogy has been about them. Do I personally believe them? Uh, not really. I'm not saying I don't believe the crazy occurrences or that they didn't happen. I'm just saying that the one thing that I know that the Warrens know how to conjure up is book deals, headlines, and a $2 billion Warner Bros. franchise. Personally, every time I see a doc, a book, or a breakdown about them, they always tend to be the producers on that doc, book, or breakdown. They're always credited or are even consultants for a majority of them. He told me from day one, he knew I was a gold digger. <laughs> And just looking at this movie, there was actually six priests that were involved in the Glatzel case, who all admit the Warrens didn't do crap. Even one of the Glatzels called out the Warrens for profiting off of their family and writing a book, altering facts. And then there was even a bunch of allegations that makes the story you're seeing up on screen look pretty funky. So know that the movies aren't as base as they say they are, but from here on out, full spoilers. The story begins with eight-year-old David Glatzel, who's been possessed, causing the Warrens and one priest to come over and exercise it. And little David's played by Julian Hilliard, who's had a scary good career so far, from WandaVision to Hill House. Like, this boy has Jacob trembling in his boots, and he's just starting. Now, according to the Warrens, in real life, they blame the possession on the family. What is the reason that David oh, yes. was possessed in the first place? The reason David became possessed was because his mother and sister Unfortunately, we're fooling around with witchcraft. In the movie though, they get into a cult who's leaving behind these witch totems in people's houses, and that's why David gets infected as he hops on this waterbed, catching a stealthily transmitted demon. Kid ends up turning into a Wetzel pretzel, which looked extra creepy because it was all done practically with a real life young contortionist. And we found this amazing young girl, Emerald Wolf. She was 12 years old when we shot it. What's amazing is when you watch the sequence, um, there's definitely face replacement because we put Julian's face on her, her body, but her body is all, everything that you're seeing, that is all, you know, was in camera. Legit, the priest was so spooked in this scene that instead of helping out, the man said he was gonna go warm up the car when he came in a taxi. Again, it is all to make Ed seem like the brave one in this, cause they really do make every priest look like a goof throughout the movie, when again, they're the ones who didn't do anything as caught on the tape that doesn't exist. Luckily, the soon-to-be brother-in-law, Arnie, volunteers his tribute to transfer the spirit over to him, and that's where he supposedly, allegedly, reportedly gets possessed. Now, the studio claimed they were ready to start a new chapter with this one right here, and take the franchise in a new direction, but a good chunk of the movie is just callbacks or imagery that we've seen before. You have all the exorcism nods that were very obvious. There's the shining walk in the movie that almost got them in trouble with the studio. They had that scary stories blob charging at the Warrens. They knew they were going up against a quiet place, because couldn't scratch the same numbers that se continuation did. But the funniest thing to me was seeing a jump cut that was so blatantly in full view of the character's peripheral, but they pull the Arnie card and get away with it since, you know, he's possessed. This also takes place during the era of satanic panic where drugs, cults, and rock and roll were considered an epidemic. I mean, that was a, a period of time in the US of a lot of paranoia and, you know, satanic frenzy and there was you know satanism was on the rise but also this sense of fear and you know paranoia in this country that it was you know reaching children through Ozzy Osbourne and rock music and you know so a lot of it was totally unfounded but then you also had events like this that were very extraordinary and there was other there was other similar you know satanic death deaths and murders which you know are you know tied into this film and you know that 
there was a lot of them if you actually, you know, look it up in the, uh, throughout the 80s. So while the claim is that Arnie was possessed when he committed murder, it could also be that he was drugged out, something the Warrens have lied about in the past when exploiting a family who wasn't really possessed but was suffering from substance abuse, as called out by the horror novelist who they hired to write about that case. Not only does the movie lie about when Lorraine called the cops, which was the day after, but it's clear he did this for his girl, considering that they cut out the extra people who were involved in the incident and the fact that he had taken them out for lunch prior. It was his soon-to-be fiance's boss slash landlord who's portrayed as being extra creepy and unhinged for the movie's sake, and I'll tell you, the craziest part of it all is that they had the real-life Arnie on set, taking pics, on the day they were reenacting the murder? So, um, I was really waiting until after we finished film to really buckle down and, and figure out what happened and, and read the books on it and everything, and, um... It just never happened because I was kind of done with that world as well. Once they're done with the possession side of the movie, they pivot into the detective side and where Ed tries to convince the court that possession is a valid argument since in the US we do swear under God in court, so you now if you can prove one, you should be able to prove the other. Court accepts the existence of God every time a witness swears to tell the truth. I think it's about time they accept the existence of the devil. It legit becomes God's Not Dead too, as they put their faith on trial, even inviting the lawyer over to their house to watch the Annabelle trilogy, which I've never understood how these items are so powerful. You gotta be careful with them. They need to be locked up. But they're always having people over. Don't ever touch anything. And if you do, let me know. In real life, the judge threw out the entire devil defense pretty quick, and the movie drops it even faster as they charge Arnie, and the movie pivots then over to the spiritual superhero side that Ed and Lorraine are. Like, the series has spanned through the decades, just like the X-Men flicks were doing. The Conjuring universe has spanned from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and now we're finally getting into the 80s. And then they end up turning Ed into Xavier as he searches for others like him who can help take down this evil, fighting to get representation in court. Hell, the second half even turns into a domestic civil war as the baddie has them turn on each other. They're practically treating Arnie like Bucky who doesn't realize the evil that he's done because he's being used as a super Satan soldier. Hell, they even have whole ass powers now. Lorraine fights against a female nightcrawler who can shapeshift, but we see that she can even remote view as she enhances her detective mode. Don't even get me started on those crazy utility buckles she had. They had Patrick out there with his Aquaman cheeks, stopping cliffhangers, had him smashing the infinity totems with a hammer to save the day. Like, like, y'all, they had matching outfits. Satan didn't stand a chance against these Fantastic Two. In terms of expanding the universe, we get a callback to the Disciples of the Ram, who we first saw back in the Annabelle movies when Janice, the girl who owned the doll, joined them, just like they hyped up the nun to be their Thanos. This would be like their sinister 666, who's clearly gonna come back in other installments, and Anna Lorraine have been warned. The lie is counter to everything that the Satanist stands for. His soul aim is chaos. They meet a retired priest named Kastner who gives them the LME on what's going on with this cult, but he doesn't admit to them that it's his daughter who's going around trick and treating, leaving totems around in order to curse people. And this ties back to the character of Jessica, who they were investigating earlier, a college girl who was also supposedly, allegedly, reportedly possessed and stabbed her friend out in the woods 22 times just like Arnie did. That's what the DC comic spinoff is about, and it's supposed to get into her backstory, which is going to be interesting to see how they flesh that out. But I'm even more curious on the fact that it's the same actress here playing Jessica that was also the actress playing the nun that goes missing in The Nun. You know, they already cast the Formiga sisters for a reason, so I could definitely see this being a character that may play a bigger role in the same vein of what they're doing with those two. Curse needs three victims to be complete. The child, the lover, and the man of God. With the Warrens being the central characters, there's definitely a big push on reflecting their relationship through the other couples that are in the movie. You know, they're the demonologists who always find a way through their love, but Arnie and Debbie would be the opposite. They're the alternate version and where one of them actually got possessed. Kastner, the priest, describes him and his wife as being the older, more depressed version of the Warrens, who is just as well versed in their line of work, even has a room full of spooky artifacts in his own home, but the difference is, he's the version of Ed without Lorraine. And even worse, He's a terrible parent. We must be careful how our obsessions are passed to our children. 
It is interesting to see how the movies went from casting Sterling Jarens as a daughter in all of the installments up until Annabelle comes home when they like gave her more lines and so they gave it to McKenna Grace only to then go back to Sterling for this one. It is shown how the cinematic Warrens made sure to push their daughter to pursue college and her passions. They make a whole moment out of that when they're in the hospital. Whereas when you compare it to Kastner, he was worse than a washed up high school quarterback. He pushed his studies so much on his kid that she ended up joining the other team. Like she's so big on Satan's side that she hates the father, her father, and goes farther than any of the other cult members because she's ready to end this franchise before. She thinks our love is our weakness. It's our strength. In the end, they're able to defeat the occultists by destroying her work from home space. They reunite through the power of love as they add a new trophy to their collection and another installment to this universe. Now I'm gonna go watch Spirit, the cartoon. Thank you all for watching this video. I'm curious to know your thoughts down below in the comment section. Uh, like I said, it's not as spooky as the other ones, but I think that if you go out to see this in theaters, some of y'all may be wearing your mask over your eyes. Uh, just like in all the sets, they always bring priests to come bless it. And I know there's always like something crazy. They always have a crazy story. And I believe this one was that a fire alarm went off with like no indication, which I know scared everybody on there, but uh, it's gonna be interesting to see how they expand on this story uh, now that they're like getting to the next decade, you know? There was supposed to be an after credits that I believe got cut so I'm not exactly sure what that would have pushed I know that they're working on a lot of spin-offs but I know one of the big things in the background one of the things that definitely got cut and may even be the scariest is all the allegations that they have against them which again supposedly reportedly allegedly but when you look into it and you see that Lorraine's contract with the studio specifically mentioned you know to make sure that they don't bring up any of those claims it's like weirdly specific, just as weird as the studio wanting to buy the life rights of the woman who lived with them and uh, made those accusations, how her name is Judy, and that's also what the Warrens named their daughter. Like, it's just a little too much, you know? Uh, you end up running into a story that, honestly, it seems like they're blaming the devil when it sounds like Lorraine made him do it. The conjuring is very, very accurate. No, that doesn't make me feel any better. By now, the actors have completely shifted to admitting that it's fully artistic expression, so they'll definitely be having free reign to do whatever they want. So I'm assuming the next decade is going to be in the 90s. That's where the next movie will be. So we'll see where they take it from there. I'm curious to see how they're able to expand it to different characters because I know these two won't always be there. And I'm not sure if there's like any other bigger staples. You know, I don't, I don't think we've met other than the doll uh, who we would root for. But at this point, I'm more afraid of Lorraine than I am of Annabelle. So uh, we'll see how this franchise continues to expand continues to go because i know they crossed to billy uh it's probably only going to be up from there so i'm um, curious to know your thoughts on this franchise on where you think they're going to take it any series any spinoffs if you're reading the comic anything else that you have to say about this one and until next time don't forget to comment like and subscribe or you'll end up at the warren's museum